Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's plenary panel, a lively discussion titled Challenges and Opportunities of Artificial Intelligence in Neuroscience and Explainability. This webinar is part of the 11th annual event in the Neuroscience Virtual Event Series. And I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots. So let's get started. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive and we encourage you to first participate by communicating with other attendees using our live chat feature during this presentation. You can find that live chat located on the left of your screen. You can also participate by submitting as many questions as you want during this presentation. To do so, simply type them into the ask a question box and click submit. Now we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of this presentation. Finally, if you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, just click on that help desk button located at the top of your screen within the navigation bar or from the lobby. I now wanna to present today's speakers, Dr. Cheng Shu Shuang, an ICON postdoctoral fellow at MIT, Dr. Guillermo Chek Ki, Principal Research Staff and Manager at TJ Watson IBM Research, and Dr. Conrad Cording will be joining them. He will be moderating the discussion, and he's from the University of Pennsylvania and co-founder of Neuromatch. For a complete biography of our speakers, please visit the presenter tab from the menu at the left of your screen. Gentlemen, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. Oh, wonderful. As your moderator, Conrad, my goal today will be for us to have a wonderful discussion with high clarity about everything we talk about and a wonderful community spirit. I guess I'm carrying that over from your match. So today's goal is to talk about challenges and opportunities of artificial intelligence and neuroscience and explainability. Much of my research has been at the intersection of these words. There was early on a lot about bringing artificial intelligence into neuroscience. And then recently I've been very concerned about explainability and I've been asking a lot of questions. And um, this little presentation, I mostly see this as an opportunity to introduce myself and so that we know who we are so that we can talk with one another even better. So let's jump right in. So in the first part of my career, I worked in a supremely explainable part of neuroscience or behavior, however you want to call it, which is the field of Bayesian behavior. So here's the, our newest paper in that area. If you have a baseball uh, a play, player, the pitcher throws the ball. Now the batter has to estimate where the ball will come in. And you can say there is a probability distribution of where the batter should expect the ball to land. And then there's a probability distribution induced by seeing the ball fly. And ultimately, the batter will have to combine both of them. In that area, Bayesian models have been very established. Now, Bayesian models were the quintessential part of uh, artificial intelligence for a long time within the field. Now, of course, over the last few years, things have very much moved to neural networks. But there was a wonderful thing about Bayesian models, which is they always only use a handful of variables. And like in this case, I might be in interested in how high is the ball. And, uh, and um, then I need to estimate that and I have uncertainty. And what do I know, my typical model might contain three variables. Or if it's a really complicated model, it might contain five variables. And they have simple relationships. I can explain to you, and that's what that field does, how variables relate to one another. You know, the ball's being thrown. There's a visual stimulus being produced. We can take that stimulus away by showing you blindness or something like that. So it, it, the models are simple. They have a small number of variables and the components of that we can really understand. Now, at the same time, I was always doing neuroscience. So let's look at different systems. But in this case, you can say this is supremely explainable. And in, in, in that sense, it's 
if you want a cornerstone of this space that we're talking about, it's not very neural. Like what, what these people don't know what's happening in brains because no one knows what's really happening in brains because it has so many neurons. But like at the same time, they also, it's not very artificial intelligence. It just uses a little sliver of that, but it's very, very explainable. So let's look at something else here. So uh, here's another paper that really shaped my thinking for a long period of time. It's uh, the so-called microprocessor paper with, uh, with Eric Jonas, where you can take a microprocessor and it's very explainable. I mean, it's explainable to the level that we will take our PhD students in computer science or electrical engineering, and we will explain a classical microprocessor to them. So in that sense, we know that there exists a way of describing that microprocessor. But at the same time, if we use methods from neuroscience to it, we will not understand how the microprocessor works. It's not explainable in a way. It's just explainable in a certain way using the language of computer scientists, the language of, uh, of processor design. So what we had found there is you can look at the properties of transistors and analyze it the same way as neuroscientists might analyze results from neurons in the brain. And uh, what we found is in a way transistor behavior looks similar to brains, but this is all a misleading description of what's really going on. So what we have there is it's very explainable. It's just not explainable with what neuroscientists usually do. Now, like, to again see where this lies in this space, and like, there's no artificial intelligence here be, besides from some properties of the methods that we have. It's very explainable, and it kind of highlights this contrast that we have, that explanations might exist, but we might not know if we're even moving towards explanations. Now, here's another recent paper. Um, uh, uh, which uh, was written with Blake Richards and Tim Lillycrab and a lot of others, where we asked the question, well, would an artificial neural network actually be explainable? And in a way it is. Now I can take the PyTorch code that makes your neural network and I can go with, through it with you line by line, no problem. By the way, this isn't like actually real code. This is just chat GPT generated network code. But we can go through the code and look through that. And every line that ChatGPT wrote here, I could understand the first time I see it. So it's very explainable in that way. But then we take this neural network and we train it on a terabyte of data. And then we ask, can we then understand the resulting network? Now the network now is just a set of basically large tensors of so the weight tensors that characterize what's going on. And in that case, you can say it's not understandable, it's not explainable. It's like explainable in the sense that all the information is on the paper, but it's certainly not explainable in the way that a human can look at that and really make sense out of that. And I think this is a really interesting contrast that in a way, in the space of neural network designs, it's explainable, but in the space of neural network computation, it's profoundly not. And I think brains are a little bit maybe similar where the ways how brains are made based on stimuli from the outside world. They depend on the statistics of the outside world. They de depend on you seeing that Conrad has blue hair in a way that's going to be smeared all over the brain into, into lots of synapses that now carry that. And so the resulting weight matrices in the brain will be very, very hard to understand, at least if we agree that the world is complex. That the way I see the world, it's full of complexity. And then you can say, well, if we want to, arguably what neuroscience does at the moment is what we see here on the right-hand side. Now we stick an electrode into a neuron and we see how it depends on the inputs. That's that's literally trying to measure the, uh, measure the weight matrix, or at least the product of the first weight matrices. And and so arguably we need to focus more on the way we do it on the left of like uh, understand brains as the code that gives rise to computation. And then I want to just show a two slides from uh, uh, from um, from uh, that new paper uh, from that paper with Richards and many other people at that neuro AI corner. What other things about brains that we should be hoping to understand? Well, 
The objective functions, what are the objective functions? Are they being optimized? In which way are they being optimized? That's definitely one of the things that we should hope to get out of this space. And I think it's this, it's if, if I wear my AI hat, this is what I want neuroscientists to do, because if we understand what brains optimize, we could build that into artificial systems. But at the same time, it's a, it's a nice high level way of describing the way um, any system that is optimized for something behaves. And then you can say the other thing that's of course very explainable are architectures. We do that extensively when we design our neural networks. Now we talk about transformers and recurrent systems and uh, convnets and all the different things. So architectures are very explainable. I mean, like they, they're one of the things that we explain and arguably what a lot of anatomists in your science do. They take the data and uh, they try and write stories about uh, how the brain may work based on the anatomy that we that we see. And I think this is a supremely explainable approach. So now, most recently, no, to, uh, just, just, just to go back, like in this area, it's we really at the intersection of, uh, of art, uh, artificial intelligence explainability, where we, where we ask, what is it that we can, uh, that we can explain? And, um, and ultimately, neuroscience. One more thing, we don't really just want explanations, but we prefer certain explanations to other explanations. Specifically, what we often want from explanations is that they have a sense of causality, that they allow us what makes what happen. Because what makes what happens is, is in a way how we define understanding as scientists. We want to see how the world is kind of a set of units that are connected to one another, that do something with one another. And it's important in neuroscience for medicine. It's important for AI because ultimately we want to choose actions if we build artificial intelligence that ultimately make us more successful, that make our company more successful, and hopefully that make the lives of us humans more successful. Now, briefly, why is this all so hard? If we're interested in how one variable affects another variable, say the lower blue variable to the higher level blue variable, the problem is this confounded. There's, there's other variables in the world or the brain that affect both variables of interest. Now, a lot of AI people believe if, well, if we can just, rec if we can just get enough data, we have all the confounders and we can correct for the confounders and all the effects, all the problems are going to go away. The slight problem is that in the world, there's also colliders, variables that are affected by both of our variables. If we correct for those variables, we make things worse. The problem is that in reality, a lot of confounders are simultaneously colliders. So that makes it very difficult to think about causality. And I think it's a, it's a wonderful and rich area where we really now have multiple areas getting together. Neuroscientists traditionally with the interest in how the brain areas interact, the AI field, and I want to just briefly plug the clear conference there that realizes that really in many cases, we want to have causal understanding in the world. And uh, lastly, the explanations field, because ultimately we want not just any explanation. We want explanations that actually get at causal truth. So that, I hope, sets up a little bit of what I want to, after hearing from our, uh, our two other panelists, what we want to see, uh, we, we, which we, we, what we want to discuss. Um, now it's time for Guillermo. Uh, Jackie's talk, and I very much look forward to that. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I need to take control. Do I have control? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, so thanks, uh, Conrad. Um, so um, this is just the, the title of the presentation that was pre-recorded and my intention here was to emphasize an aspect that I think as of um, a sort of conjugate the complementary of explanation and that is how to use not only for the purpose of explanation but even for the purpose of uh, uh, developing more better models how do we use what we know already Right, and Conrad already referred to this sort of underlying, sometimes 
unconscious idea that all we need is data, right? If we have enough data, we can solve every problem. And that seems to work well um, in the case of language models that have uh, probably everyone knows, and because there are you know, gazillions of data out there to train some aspects of, of language analytics, but it doesn't really, we don't expect that it will work well with the brain. Uh, we have 100 billion neurons and so many connections, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, you know, it's important to understand how we incorporate uh, what we know already, right? Um, so I'll present a couple of examples that to some extent encapsulate uh, the way uh, with many other colleagues, we've been thinking about this. And uh, for several reasons, one of, from the AI perspective, one reason is that uh, language analytics or language models or large language models have really uh, spearheaded a revolution in AI that uh, we see every single day. And, and uh, some of the most powerful AI models are language models. So the, the language technology is incredibly powerful in many respects. And also because uh, as an, uh, uh, computer scientists or mathematicians or physicists, we have tended to ignore behavior uh, as something not as important as you know, microscopic mechanisms. And that is, it. I think it's a mistake. And I usually <laughs> use the analogy from physics, right? So in physics, we didn't invent statistical mechanics and then develop thermodynamics. It was the other way around. You know, we started with understanding how Napoleon's uh, cannons uh, Heat it up. I was Carnot, developed the idea of the microscopic behavior of gases. And then we were able to go back to uh, the molecules and say, you know, temperature and the movement of the molecules, that's the right connection. So uh, that's the other reason. We need to do the thermodynamics of the behavior of the brain if we have any hope of linking, linking that back to the microstructures. Uh, so, how is this related to what uh, we are discussing here? And, and these are a couple of examples of how we are thinking of using what we know already to have better models for understanding behavior. And uh, in one case, uh, well, these two cases are related to what happens with uh, patients who have schizophrenia of uh, patients or individuals in general that may eventually uh, develop schizophrenia because they have some of the symptoms. And typically, the way to characterize their behavior is to uh, evaluate uh, what they are saying. So uh, an expert evaluates what they are saying. Sometimes you um, ask them to fill a questionnaire where they have to say, you know, between one and five, uh, how strong are your hallucinations? Or between one and five, uh, how often do you think about your experience in yourself from outside, etc.? cetera? Uh, what we are doing is using uh, these language models that allow you to, for instance, compute how similar one sentence is to another, one paragraph is to another. And then uh, in one of the studies, we asked uh, the experts, the, the experts in, in the experience of schizophrenia in patients, what do they expect the patients to say in a completely uh, open-ended interview? Right? So the patients speak freely, and then we use this technology to map what they are saying to the targets that are designed by by the experts, right? So in that case, 
we work with a group of experts that they say, well, you know, it's likely they will say this or that, you know, they were wondering what happened to them, wondering about the sense of agency. And then we can, sh we show that by using this technology, we can identify precisely a preoccupation with the sense of lack of agency uh, as in a completely natural, naturalistic way of eliciting uh, speech. Um, and then, you know, in the subsequent study, we generalized that and we went to establish inventories, questionnaires that are used clinically or at least in clinical research. And they have been validated in terms of the community understanding this is a very good way of asking what's going on with patients using scales in the questionnaires of self-assessment. Self so we can repeat that in a completely open-ended uh, uh, setting for eliciting the, the speech of patients. And what you know, one thing that is interesting is that the signal to separate, for instance, schizophrenics from subthreshold schizophrenics is stronger. And if anything, is the opposite in direction to the self-assessment, right? So, which it's a you know it's a different problem. It's super interesting, but the point is that we can use this technology uh, to both gain knowledge, uh, but also at the same time gain understanding because we are explaining onto things that we already know and they are already well established, right? Uh, apologies, I think your slides aren't advancing so far. Okay. Now you see the one. Yeah. Uh, now it's okay. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. It it lost. Yeah. It lost control for some reason. Okay. Um. So another example and. Uh, and this is again going back to the brain and and uh but it's in the same spirit as the one before is you know we were ask, asking uh how can we incorporate knowledge uh in in what you know whatever we know about the brain as Conrad said you know we know a lot and we know little uh and combine that with this very obscure black boxes that uh, in terms of performance are extremely powerful uh, uh, artificial neural network models, right? Deep learning, you know, all the uh, very recent models. And this is one way, right? It, it, it's one possibility. Uh, I don't think it's the solution, but it's a way, a way of thinking about the problem is, um, you can take uh, a functional data, right? So uh, fMRI, in this case, we also use calcium imaging in the zebrafish and try to uh, learn a model that would predict the evolution of that uh, uh, that signal. If you, if you see a section of it, you know, can you predict the future? And you can use one of these deep learning models and it does a good job, but there's not really much uh, in terms of understanding what's going on right so you essentially you can you can really uh come up with a good uh outer acid model um so what we did was to say well if uh, some in the guts of these models there are specific uh assumptions about how the units that you're modeling are interacting with each other uh if you do something like a model based on what we know about the behavior of small networks of neurons, is it possible to do something that it will be more interpretable because the dynamics of those uh, small number of neurons you know and you're modeling uh, will allow you to come up with something that is more related to what we know. And what happens is that uh, if you just do a more classical model where you replace uh, the, the units in, in your data with this model units, uh, you do something good, but it's not 
as good as the black box. But if you train the black box with one of these models, then you get something that is even better, right? So at least, at the very least, you can get uh, an improvement in the way you can model because you have incorporated existing knowledge uh, in the field. Um, and then let me uh, conclude here. Um, and again, this was taken from the talk uh, on the theme of how to incorporate knowledge. So what we saw, uh, and this seems to work well, at least with uh, language models, that uh, we can create new insights based on pre-explained models. So we can back, we can map things to to what we know using uh, what otherwise are sort of black box models. Uh, it, it has, in the case of language, it has some advantages because you can use naturalistic settings. Uh, but and, and this is something that you know the last bullet I added at the end. Um, we're experiencing the phenomenal change in AI capabilities, and everyone probably knows about ChatGPT today. And I think the way we uh, think about the explanations may change, right? So the things that are happening with ChatGPT and ChatGPT-like uh, algorithms is that you can engage in an iterative, interactive interpretation and explanation with all the caveats that we can think of, but that's something that is new, and you know we are just beginning. So the way we think about the explanation may be changing because of this. And with that, I stop. Wonderful, thanks so much. Thank um, you. Very much looking forward to the presentation of Cheng Shu then. Great. Uh, there might be some slides not shown, but uh, feel free to ask any questions to Jerome um, in the question and answer. And with that, I will start my talk. Uh, it's a quick summary for the content that I gave um, during the 30-minute recording. Um, and in this talk, I would talk about neural network models of visual learning and the development. So, um, in this talk, I will talk about how we can reverse engineer basically the objective function that we use to train the models um, so that the models would learn and develop just like how neural system, how humans, how other real animals will do, okay? And I focus on uh, visual system. So visual system is a complicated system. Um, it uh, processes a lot of inputs in our real world. Um, earlier work have shown that if you train artificial neural networks um, to do categorization, meaning that you give an image um, to tell whether it's a dog or cat or other semantic categories, if you train a network to do that, um, the networks will end up being a good model of the eventual visual pathway, uh, which is a pathway in our brain that, that's responsible for like static image uh, categorization or representation. Um, but these networks um, cannot explain the visual learning and the development. Why is that? I'm going to list three reasons. The first and also the biggest reason is that they require many more labels during learning than humans. What I mean by this is that these networks are typically trained on large scale data sets such as ImageNet, which contains 1.2 million labels. There's no way that human infants or like um, primates, for example, can receive so many labels. So their objective function is really wrong um, in giving the learning and the development trajectory. So second reason is that they are not trained on the correct data. Um, I mentioned that they were typically trained on like ImageNet, which contains static images and all of these um, uh, multiple instances of the same category. But infants regularly see like the same instance, but maybe from different viewpoints. And also they see continuous stream of inputs instead of static images. So this really makes um, them the worst model of the uh, learning and the development. The third reason, which I will explain more later, is that they are trained in a so-called offline fashion, meaning that the models are typically trained um, uh, uh, in repeating the same data over and over again to the models. 
Okay, with that, I will then talk about three projects uh, my colleagues and I have worked on to address these three issues. Now, the first project is about um, changing the objective function to be unsupervised learning functions. Now, this means that we need a new objective function that don't leverage or don't use any labels at all. This algorithm is typically called unsupervised learning algorithms. And the earlier versions of these algorithms prior to like year 2019 or 2018 were really not good enough. They were not good enough um, in uh, doing downstream visual tasks. They were also, importantly, not good at modeling the visual system. This is why at 2018 or 2019, there is a, this new family of unsupervised learning algorithms called contrastive learning algorithms, and they work better. So let me give you an example of how this algorithm works um, by talking about one algorithm that I and my colleagues developed called the local aggregation algorithm. So this algorithm trains the networks to do semantically aggregation within the input space. What I mean by this is that it will develop a network representation so that the high level output of the network will aggregate the current inputs and also some close neighbors we identified in the embedding space and making them farther away from background neighbors, meaning similar but not that similar. So after doing so, we find that, that these methods um, uh, uh, model the ventral visual pathway better than earlier methods. It also achieved the good performance and also the best performance when it was published um, on typical computer vision benchmarks. So that was the first project. Uh, we now don't need the labels. But as I mentioned, they were still trained on different data. Um, so the previous uh, networks still were trained on ImageNet, which is very different from what children perceive during their development. And this is why we use another data set that's much closer to how humans actually develop during their um, earlier lives, which is the CCAM data set. This data set is collected by having head cameras on children and collecting basically videos of their real life interactions. Now, this video data, this data set consists of videos and therefore is very different from the previous data set that we used to train our networks. This is why we developed a new algorithm um, to learn from these videos. We call that v VIE algorithm, the video instance embedding algorithm. Um, the general idea of this algorithm is that we will leverage the temporal information within the videos. Um, and we use shorter temporal events to aggregate the, um, the frames together while separate the representation of these frames from the representation for other temporal events that are not close to them. So after doing that, we find that this algorithm leads to better neural predictivity on the virtual visual pathway when trained on CCAM um, dataset than other methods. So this really shows that this way of leveraging the temporal information through aggregating the things, through aggregating the temporal frames are really um, powerful. Now, I mentioned that the models are still trained in a so-called offline um, learning. So the third project, I will address this question by changing the learning to an online learning fashion. Um, so, the offline learning fashion is really wrong, especially if we want to compare the intermediate track points of the models to the intermediate points of children development. Because models see all the data at the beginning, but humans, for example, at age of four, they see part of the data of the whole development trajectory. So to address this difference, um, we aligned the model and the human uh, learning uh, presentation order, meaning that we present the videos recorded from children in the same order um, to the models. Here, the epoch number represents um, the, uh, uh, the presentation order or the learning order of the models. Now, if you do that, and also within one epoch, you would present the frames to the models at the same order of the being, uh, frame being recorded in the video. Now, if you do that, there is really a critical component now being needed, which is memory. That's really because if you don't have memory, um, networks will soon forget the earlier inputs and then therefore lose the prior progress. So we added a memory module to the algorithms, to all algorithms, and we find that we need to learn partially from the memory, but not all from the memory. Because if you just learn from the memory, not paying attention to the current environment, this will really make the model unresponsive um, to the current changes. Now, interestingly, 
th there is also a par paradigm change in the unsupervised learning algorithms in the recent several years about how memory should be used. Earlier algorithm actually actively uses memory by contrasting one example in the memory to the other, making some difference, while recent algorithms no longer need to do that. So after evaluating this, all these algorithms on how good they modeling the lifelong and also the real time different scales and the developed trajectories, we find that their algorithms actually better model the learning dynamic. This is a really a very surprising finding for us because newer algorithms typically outperform these earlier algorithms on AI benchmarks. However, earlier algorithms which actively use memory, which we humans also do, is really a better model for human learning in both real time and lifelong learning dynamics. Now, this is definitely not the end of comparing models to humans about how they should learn and develop. For now, what I have talked about is all on the meaning that the most just perceive visual inputs, but we know that humans perceive multiple modalities of um, vision, lung, for example. Um, and this is also why my current research project is about how language development um, can be modeled by uh, large scale apps such as ChatGPT or GPT-3. If you have more interest, feel free to reach out and ask questions. With that, I will make my presentation and move to the next slide. Wonderful. There, uh, it, it, it was great to hear about my my co panelists. It's it's nice to see the breadth of ideas that we have there. Um, I was going to start with a, with a few points that I picked up in your talks, and then I want to like us to go more broadly. So maybe the first question that I have, have for you, Sheng Shu. I I, I, under, I I admire how you bring the strong ethological component into it. Like your models are based on a consideration of how the world is. So I was wondering when it comes to explanation, and it, I know it's a big stretch from anywhere in AI or neuroscience to explanation, but but it's still like a big topic for our audience, I think. Uh, to which level would you say that ethological ways of thinking offer a new way of explanation where you could say, maybe you can't tell me how the AI system or my brain does it, but you can relate it to kind of like, what is that situation in which, we're, which we are? So I was hoping you could expound a little bit on like the, the links between ethological ways of thinking and explanation. Yeah. Um, are you talking about, for example, how these networks can tell us about how brain system work? Um, this type of questions. Um, so the 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 works that I presented is really about um, reverse engineering or understanding what type of objective functions might be the functions that humans use um, during their learning and the development in real life. That means, for example. Um, we needed to find a way um, to group the visual stimuli into different, in, into semantically meaningful like classes, um, categories. Here, categories are really not the semantic categories that we usually talk about, like dogs or cats. They might be more abstract, and these things are like doable, meaning that we don't need a, like uh, uh, access to like supervision or labels that we um, should not have access to in our real life, and uh, these things can. Um, what I have shown in my work is that um, if we do um, this type of training in the neural networks, they indeed lead to representations that are similar um, to the visual system. So what I would argue is that um, this tells us that what type of representation um, can be generated with this ob um, objective function, and uh, this makes this objective function one of the candidates in how humans might develop their visual system. So, so I then hope. the objective yeah. function becomes the prime objective of explanation. Like, the, if, if, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to like like push you into the explanation corner. Like, um, at some level, if you can write down the objective function, then the idea is that that objective function will be compact. The self-supervised learning goal will be compact, and then by being so, we can build systems around them. Now, like, would that be a fair characterization? Right. It's like saying 
I would I would I would say, for example, the brain system, the dynamics of the brain system is to optimize certain things, is to optimize certain criteria, and then using that high level idea, we would be able to understand how these dynamics unfold. Um, what are the specific dynamics functions for this target for this objective function, and of course, like this is something like a middle level explanation. It's not like the bottom level, like how each synapses, um, how each of the synapses will change um, to reflect this um, objective function to like address this. That's definitely another question that we should continue to explore and continue to investigate. One, wonderful. So, so I wanted to uh, uh, push Guijama on, on more or less the same point. Now, like you're using uh, ensemble ma methods in the end. Uh, where is, is would, would you say this is a place where there's something about about the architecture that 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 is ultimately the explainable component? Where, where, where would you where would you how would you describe how explanation comes into your work? Um, it's a <laughs> very good question. You know, in, to some extent, what I presented today is sort of kicking the can down the road because you're pushing back the explanation onto what we know as you know as experts, right? So what we understand is relevant and. Actually, that's been quite a bit of uh, a big part of my work, and that is trying to understand how a clinician, a psychiatrist, a neurologist makes a judgment and create an algorithm that will try to replicate that. So the explanation is essentially uh, is pushed back onto. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um. Push back onto uh, the the expert in the field, right? So yeah. it's, it's yeah. giving an uh, analytics, uh, uh, giving an, a number to the intuition of, for instance, what it means to um, to have a distorted experience of the self uh, in uh, in a person with uh, schizophrenia or schizophrenia spectrum, um, and. You know, that is what these models allow us to do, right? Is to provide a numerical counterpart to the subjective experience of the person and the subjective judgment of the expert, right? And in that sense, that is what in in this context explanation means. It's just show that there is a, a common and the the, the is the objective objectification of the subjective judgment and subjective experience by saying, well, we can put a number to it. And we all agree that we are measuring the same thing, incomplete as it might be, or to the extent that it reflects the, the, the experience of a particular uh, symptom, for instance, right? Uh, and, and that is how I think about explanation in this, in this context, right? Um, great. So, so let me push more on the point now relating that to knowledge. So you can say knowledge is a specific. Uh, it's, it's a specific piece of an explanation for you. Now, like, can can you can you maybe like go a little more into details about the role and and function of knowledge in the process of explain, uh, explanation? Right. Um... At the end of you know, one way of thinking about explanation is um, putting, you know, mapping something new onto what you already know, right? And, and that, so referring to uh, a particular phenomenon onto the coordinates that you have already built uh, in your mind, right? So, and, and Again, this is well, 
we lost Conrad. Uh, he will be back soon. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um. I think you can continue. Uh, right. Yeah. He's he's back. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> yeah. Um. And and again, in, when we are talking about, for instance, behavior in particular, it's. Is I I think is the best thing that we can do is you know, what we have established we, we have established as a community as, as you know as a culture you know what it means, uh, to have, uh, for instance a a um, an experience out of body experience in someone with with the psychosis spectrum, and the fact that we can talk about it and the the fact that. We can discuss and have an under, a common understanding of what it means. Explanations in this case, it's, it, it simply means we have a way of poorly as it might be measure that and understand that we can apply the same um, the same ruler to different people and obtain something that is similar and and sort of the you know, the way I, the, the way I think about the difference between subjective and objective. Objective is that which is common and we can all understand, right? And language is an essential part of that, right? So it, in this context, that's how I explain, sorry, that's how I understand the concept of explanation, referring that to a common objective ground, right? And, and of things, in this case, things that are inherently subjective, like the piece of self, but see we can talk about and have a common understanding so that's for me the way i'm thinking about this what explanation is in this case right referring referring something to a common background of understanding uh, one, wonderful i now want to uh, focus a little bit away of the core of explanation and talk a little bit about more the technologies in our space and i want to start kick this off with the question of Donasian Ochala, who asks uh, specifically into the direction of Cheng Shu of uh, the difference between offline learning and online learning. And I think uh, it's an important technical detail that, yeah. that, uh, that suddenly neuroscientists almost never discuss. Why can't you give, a, can you give us a little bit of a background about that and then talk about the, the difference and uh, advantages of the two of them? Sure, sounds good. So offline learning is really a learning, um, I would call it curriculum, that's typically used by computer science or artificial um, intelligence community. The way this learning um, happens is that it will first collect all the data that's available. For example, imagine a human going through um, um, multiple years of life and uh, let's say 100 years of life and all this experience like what offline learning will do is to collect all these years of experience together and then use this all these uh, experience randomly select segments from them and then present them to the models to help them train at the beginning. So the problem, um, and the, um, it's a powerful learning curriculum um, because um, when you do this, um, you will have wider access to a larger diversity of different stimuli, and therefore um, your learning will be like situated to uh, fulfill multiple demands. But this is ho not how humans learn, um, because humans need to face a continuous stream of data um, like uh, going through their um, all their perceptual like uh, uh, modalities like eyes uh, like vision for eyes and uh, auditory um, for ears for example and all these inputs are actually happening together happening in a continuous um, fashion instead of like accumulating all the things and then like shuffling them and then presenting them um, at the beginning. So humans need to do online learning. This is actually ecological um, like uh, constraints um, to humans. And we find that models, when they, when they are evaluated in the online learning fashion, they will be like um, uh, less powerful than the models evaluated in the offline fashion, evaluated on this uh, typical computer vision benchmarks. Um, however, um, these models evaluated in the online fashion will also be more human-like. Um, and also it will place a stronger constraint on how the models should learn from this continuous data stream. 
so that the objective function will also be closer to how humans learn. Uh, so this is basically my answer to this offline versus online learning question. The high level point is really that humans need to do online learning. Computer system can leverage the offline learning, but that's not something humans can do. Oh, we I lost. Don't... We lost your voice. Yeah, Conrad. Conrad, I don't think we hear you. Okay, here's, oh, yeah. here's my voice back and I've, I'm three years into four years into the pandemic and I still don't know how to click the unmute button, um, <laughs> which is uh, which is a little a little sad. But uh, what I was just going to say is it sounded a little bit as as if online learning is a bad thing in a way, like all biological beings have to do that now because and it's a good thing in a way because the future is different. So it's not just that we want to have access to all of that. It's kind of like what I'm learning right now in this debate is much more important for this debate than maybe my my 49 years of prior experience uh, into that. So there's this like it's a really complicated space in how we should be thinking about this. Exactly, exactly. And this is why my work actually compares models in both the lifelong and also the real time learning. Real time learning dynamics. Humans do learn in real time, like we are learning in the, sitting in this um, debate. And this is like how humans will pay attention to the current context and therefore like um, ad adapt very rapidly to the current context. And the humans do that because they have this online learning. If humans just have offline learning, they want to be able to do that. So this is definitely a benefit of the online learning. So, uh, Conrad, I have a question for you or, or a, a request for comments more than a question. I, I was interested by the example of, of the, uh, of the processor that you used. And, um, I find it interesting because it opens the question of, of, you know, does the ability of building something means that we understand it, right? And it is a lot of question because I know by by way of being in IBM, I know people whose work is to simulate CPUs after they have built, because even after we build them, we don't know how they're going to work, right? Yes, I'm of course with you there. I mean, the, the statement of course goes back to Feynman, what I can't build, I don't understand. But you're obviously right that what I can build, I can most certainly not understand. I mean, <laughs> like try explain ChatGPT to me how it really processes information. It, it, it's it, it's mind boggling at times. So 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 in that sense, uh, yes. I mean, like I'm I'm hundred percent with you that basically being able to build it doesn't mean we we understand it. In fact, there's there's really a problem that in domains with high complexity like human society biology, bacteria, but also nervous systems, that they, even if we could, they would soak up so much information from the environment. And arguably, like your microprocessor, the actual microprocessor soak up information from physics all the way down, uh, right. that, 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 we, that, that understanding is much more complicated than, than just having the equations there. It's it's a great question. Now, and this is actually a wonderful place to wrap up this overall panel. I had great fun. I think we all agree that in a way we are at that surface. Now we are trying to, we are here in this space where three really interesting communities meet. The explainability community, the neuroscience community, and the AI community. I liked how the two of you were covering different parts of that space. And I hope that I covered like yet another corner of this. But, but I think it's clear to me, I, I, I expect it's clear to the audience as well, we're just scratching the surface there because it's this incredibly rich, basically neuro human brain complete quest that we are on. Uh, we have to wrap up roughly at this time. So I want to thank the two of you again and give the word back to the organizer of Lab Roots who will want to give us a few last messages. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for this informative presentation and such important research. Before we go, I do want to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions and questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker 
via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand for two years until March 8th, 2025. Labrates will alert you via email when it's available for replay. Thank you again, gentlemen. And we encourage all of you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, everyone. Bye-bye.